thank you for having me. So um, I wasn't sure how to prepare this talk, so I don't know if it will work, so forgive me if it doesn't. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about self-assembly. Um, part of the talk, at least part of this research program for me over the years has been to figure out what this word means. Um, it's bandied about frequently, and if nothing else, this talk should express an opinion. Which you can agree with not. So the way that the talk goes is the following. First, I'm going to give the general nonsense that Warren's supposed to give. I'm um, going to talk about self-assembly. Then um, the general nonsense, I hope, will motivate two specific calculations and models. I was told that this was an audience that was intellectually very diverse and that I should be gentle. But looking out at the audience, I feel quite scared. And so I'm not now <laughs> sure if that was the right thing to do. But anyway, we can go into more detail than who cares. And then um, after I do that, I want to sort of talk about what I'm most interested in at the moment, um, which is the question of really moving beyond this talk and beyond just sort of basic ideas of self-assembly, which essentially, just to cut the chase, is about the question of what else can one do with programmed interactions. And hopefully I'll get to the end and you'll understand what I mean by that. Okay, so um, the work I'm going to tell you about um, has been done over the years with a very talented group of collaborators, <coughs> and postdocs, and graduate students. So, um, so actually, the um, the, um, my interest in this really started with my colleague Vinny Manaharan, who's an experimental physicist, um, who um, really helped you know, together. We sort of argued for a long time about how to think about this problem. The work I'm going to tell you about today, the two specific calculations are done by two very talented postdocs, Sarana and Arvin, and I'll tell you about it when we get to it. Um, but it sort of builds on work of many others. Okay, so here's the general nonsense. So the way you're supposed to start a talk like this is to observe that there are huge differences in the assembly mechanisms between the way that humans build things and the way that biological systems build things. Um, humans build things by like, you know, putting them exactly where they need to go, and the sort of scale that, of, of structures that can be built in this way really depends on how precisely you can put them down, where at least the way the story goes in biology, things spontaneously form into complicated structures. And um, the sort of crux of the intellectual question is to try to figure out what the principles of doing this are and really how we could, in principle, harness them to make materials, for example. Um, so um, biology is replete with examples. I'm just going to flash through um, a couple of things that self-assemble. Um, and um, So th this is sort of a picture of microtubule, which is a, a, a long tube, um, which basically has 13 filaments uh, around. And the tube is made out of two proteins, alpha and beta tubulin, which dimerize. They stick to each other, and they form long chains. And through some process, they um, make this tube. Um, sort of my favorite example, or I think really the most striking example of, of self-assembly in biology is the ribosome. So something like a third to a half of the dry weight of a cell is ribosome. This is something you could estimate for yourself with simple calculation of how many, you know, how many ribosomes do you need to produce all the proteins that there are given some reasonable assumption of rate. And, um, and so there's a lot of stuff in it. And each ribosome, so ribosomes have two big components. The smaller component, which is um, essentially a proofreading component is called the 30S component, and it's composed of 20 different accessory proteins that, that in different shapes, plus a long RNA strand. And um, so there was an experiment that was done in 1968 by Nomura in which he purified the different components, and he basically put the proteins and the RNA all into a tube, basically <coughs> shook up the tube or did something with the tube, and out came functional 30S ribosomes. So they weren't as functional, according to whatever metric, you know, as native ones, but they, they worked, and that sort of suggested that it spontaneously assembled into the structure in question. And then, you know, if you open up a biology textbook, it's filled with things. So the new, I mean, there are you know, just massive numbers of structures which have a large number of distinct proteins, which in a ball of gook, um, apparently assemble into um, something which really has to be very precisely held together. And the question really is how. And so, um, so just to sort of drive this point home a little, and this will relate to some of the mathematical models in the talk, so there's this very nice database that Sarah Teichman from Cambridge put together in the last couple of years, which is called 3D Complex, in which what she did was she basically curated the uh, protein complexes. These are structures that are made out of different types of uh, proteins. So this is the blue is one and the yellow is another, and sort of made a database of all of the different sort of graphs that come out of those and did her best to estimate based on, you know, um, whatever experiments on what the strengths of the interactions were. And there's just a huge number of different things that basically do this. Now, of course, when you see a structure like this, um, beta and alpha have a specific binding site that, that allows them to stick in this way. And um, anyway, this is sort of all over the place. 
So and then I guess I already said this, but it's worth saying again that so these all assemble in a soup. This is a sort of popular picture of the soup inside of the cell. So there's lots of other stuff around. Um, it's very hard to make stuff that doesn't stick to other stuff. I'll talk about this in a minute. I mean, you, you, it's not. You know, and um, and it, what seems and so there are lots of possibilities for things going wrong. I mean, that's the sort of most perplexing thing. I mean, you would think that. Um, that, you know, the yield of anything, if you just shut them all in there, it should be bad. A degrading yield in all of the examples that I said, it really seems bad. And so, um, so this sort of gives rise to questions of how are you supposed to, you know, take this and make it into an intellectualizable problem that one can either use to do material science um, or one can use to try to think about, just invent an intellectual construct to think about this mess. And that's basically the, what this talk is supposed to be about. Whether it's about that is your easy to judge. That's what so, by the way, I don't know if this is an informal people ask questions here. I hope you do, because I become very insecure if no one says anything. So, I, so in my mind, the phrase self-assembly is, is somewhat abused. I mean, basically, there are, um, I mean, you know, there are lots of things in life that you shove them together in a jar and they assemble in the structure. So here's an example. These are little purple blocks, and let's just say for the example, they all stick to each other and they're all the same. So clearly, you know, you can assemble these little purple blocks into lots of different structures. And one can say that these self-assembled into these structures, except that what you get out, actually the relationship, the interesting thing is the relationship between the output and the input. And what you get out is just crap. It sort of just depends on the structure of the input. Let's just be taped to it. So, um, so, um, so I, I guess, you know, we sort of, so actually our early work on self-assembly, I'm just going to show you a figure from it, which will be come around a bit later, um, was very much in the spirit. You know, you just throw things into a jar and you see what happens. So with Vinny, I guess now it was a long time ago, it was like four years ago or something ago, I don't remember. Um, Vinny did this beautiful experiment where he took colloidal spheres, so these are micron-sized spheres, and he made them interact via the so-called depletion interaction, I mean, which basically puts a sea of little particles around it, and that basically causes two particles to stick to each other um, with a range that's of order the size of the little particles. This is called the depletion interaction. And Vinny basically just made lots of wells. Um, it's just the entropy. So basically the entropy, it's just pure entropy. It's a beautiful entropic interaction. And so the point is Vinny then just sort of made lots of little wells and put some number of the big particles in each of the wells and then looked at the um, statistics of what formed. I mean, this is very much like the purple block example. And we then um, sort of spent time, you know, measuring the probabilities of occurrences of the different structures and, um, and sort of calculating theoretically and comparing. And basically, I'll get back to this in a minute, but, or in a little bit later, but these are clusters of spheres. And so these are clusters of seven spheres. It turns out that there are, at least you know, including chirality, six different clusters of seven spheres that have the maximal number of contacts. And this are, these are sort of comparisons of experimental um, you know, data for how the occurrence probabilities of these different things. And these are theoretical calculations. And what I want to say about this is that this, at least in the way that I want to use it, isn't really, this is not the type of self-assembly that I want to talk about. It's true that it assembles into all of these structures. But for us, the interesting question is really, how does one make a particular structure form? Not, you know, if I give you what you have, then it makes some distribution of things. It's, and, and that, the, um, so I said, asking what assembled is interesting, but it's much less fun if you can't control it somehow. But so it's clearly not random. It's not at all random. No, it, it, it follows from the laws of physics. What happens? I mean, you know, this follows. I mean, this you know, the fact that these bars and these dots agree with each other shows that the that the um, that, you know the system is equilibrated and it follows the laws of physics. It's fine. This is a nice exercise for a statistical mechanics class. H however, the point is, is that you know, if you're interested in the questions that I put down at the beginning, if you really want to use this to do something, this is a disaster because if you happen to decide that you want that structure, well, congratulations, you've got thirty percent. So the question is, is how can you manipulate that? And there's an easy answer to that. It's an easy answer, which is that you somehow, and it's not deep in any way, that so self-assembly requires that you somehow put information into the components about what you want to build. And that information in this context is in the form of interactions between blocks. So for example, I could you could imagine that I could basically make these blocks in such a way, different colors, so everybody sticks to some everybody else in different ways, so that it makes a particular structure. And I could design, it's sort of trivial to design an energy function that causes that structure. Um, and so the question is, really, how can you use information that is you know, in, the, in the most parsimonious or not ways to create desired structures? Or, and this is what I'm actually really interested in at the moment, and I'm going to sort of touch on this slightly at the end if I have time, which is, is that this, you know, the notion of sort of using interactions to assemble a particular structure seems rather prosaic. And um, th there are just many things you can do with interactions if you could play, you know, if you could play God with them, which is what we're trying to do. 
Um, and so th this is the sort of general thing that we've been daydreaming about. So, okay, and I'm going to show you two specific examples from the literature that we found quite inspirational, and then I'm going to go on and show you our calculations. So still, there have been very few questions. Is this because I'm being perfectly clear? Oh, okay, great. So one set of examples that I found quite stunning from the very beginning um, is the, um, are the problems of DNA self-assembly, which of course started with Ned Seaman um, at NYU. And um, the, um, the, um, there's a recent paper, um, which I just think is amazing, um, by Pang Yin and William Shi at Harvard Medical School, in which what they do is they take little strands of DNA um, that are all different from each other, and they, they design them so that they hybridize in particular ways so that they, get, they make them, and you don't have to understand this figure other than to get the idea, do what they call Lego blocks to make three-dimensional structures. So they're basically able to program little components that they just dump in solution to, to assemble into three-dimensional components. And this is sort of the last, or one of the last things that's happened in the field, which has just been enormously successful over the past 10 years, say. And I mean, so, and it, so if you walk into Pong and Williams' lab and you say, hey guys, that's amazing that you assemble them, what is the yield? Right, the thing that you, first of all, they'll show you, they'll just dazzle you with the things that they've assembled. I mean, you know, this is an H. I mean, that's not very dazzling, but if you look at the paper, then there's just all sorts of things they assemble. The reason I showed this particular thing that they assembled is that the way that they measure yield is that they, they use a gel to basically, um, to, you know, to find how much mass there is in the structure, and they just measure the mass of this relative to everything else. And in that sense, the yield is quite high. This is what they report. And, they don't, you know, they, they know what they're doing. The, the interactions are tuned, right? But there's not, there's not a. Was this only pairwise interactions? This is pair, so this is hybridization of DNA. So this is two pieces of DNA, and you know, they self-hybridize. So it's pairwise. Pairwise, yes. Um, that's the story, and I think it's roughly true. And so we were very surprised that the yield was high, right? They, you know, Tom came and gave this talk, and we were like, "How can your yield be high? Whatever we make, the yield is high." And I, we, look, we were very surprised, but we weren't sure if we should be surprised. And that's going to give rise. Well, what about mistakes? Is there yeah, so, so, well, mistakes? This, is, this is the reason I said this. The definition of mistake, you have to be very careful about, right? The definition of mistake from their statement of high yield is that they're looking at the mass of the total. So of course, there are going to be, I mean, it has to be, right? That if you look at these little h's, there are all sorts of little mistakes. So they're using it in a, a definition, which is, um, you know, well, it is what it is. Yeah. Right? I'm not really willing to say that. I mean, they look like ages. I mean, before this, some of you have seen this. Paul Rothman made maps of Europe using a single um, DNA strand. I mean, it's amazing. I just and yeah, there are mistakes, but so I mean, there are defects, there are errors, there's all that. But still, the yield, the general yield, was high. And the question is, is that if you have a system in which the objects are all different, right? What should we expect the yield to be, and what can we make it be? That's really what the question is, because of course, um, well, I'm because. Sure. Of, yeah, yeah, I mean, a key thing of this must have been to control the hybridization conditions. Absolutely. If you have them to be sure. too far off, Absolutely. you're going to make endless mistakes. Well, I mean, so, you know, there's the, there's the question of what should the energy of the hybridization yeah. be? You know, if it's too strong, right, so that it doesn't come off, then you're essentially going to get irreversible aggregation in incorrect states. If it's too weak, it's going to fall apart. But they're smart, and they figured out that there's a range. Yeah. So, but, but, but this is, you know, it's not a systematic study. So, okay, anyway, this is one set of examples. So another set of examples which is different, which really comes from material science, um, is the example of um, DNA coded colloids. This is something that Paul and his colleagues at NYU have been really pioneering over the last years. The, the, um, the field more or less started, Paul can correct me, by Chad Merkin, who was coding nanoparticles with DNA. And I think that, and this is sort of a recent paper that they wrote, which just sort of shows what, where they are. So what they did, they take, take small particles, coat them with DNA strands. So A and B are different strands. You basically set it up so that you know you <coughs> control that B sticks to, to B's and A's stick to A's, but B's don't stick to A's, right? So you literally can have particles which, with short range interactions, you can control who sticks to whom. And th the demonstration in this paper, what they did was they um, they took two different particles which had two different sizes, each was coated with different types of D different DNA strands. And by changing the size ratio of the particles and the linker ratio, that's just the length, the, the length of the DNA strands, they were able to make a phase diagram of a huge set of crystal lattices that had been, you know, sort of discussed by Pauling in the 1920s. And it's just, you know, to me, the thing that's that's just spectacular about this is the degree of control that basically one has. And again, you know, the questions of yield, right? I mean, you know, of, of, you know, what, what can you? But, but this, of course, is only with two. This is, this is essentially a binary mixture. It's not, you know, in the limit that I'm really interested in, you know, which is all the part that we look at. 
So okay, so if this is background, I want what I want to do, and I don't know if this is what I think, but this is what I'm going to do, is I'm going to talk about two mathematical models. Um, and, e and each model is sort of, I think, illustrates, I'm showing them because I think it's going to sort of illustrate different things. We're just sort of working our way through this landscape and trying to figure out how to think about it. But these are the two models that we found to be the most insightful at the moment. The first model was one of um, branched puddle, puzzle pieces and was really inspired by um, the, the sort of DNA assembly or protein complexes that I showed you before. And what we're going to do is, the DNA <coughs> and this is work that Arvind did, um, is we're going to have different puzzle pieces. They're literally going to be puzzle pieces as I've described. Um, so different colors means everybody who has the same color um, interacts with everybody else with the same, everybody else in the same way. Um, and they have male and female parts and they can only stick in two places. And, um, and what we're going to do is put these in solution at finite concentration and we're going to talk about you know, what you need to do to assemble things with high yield. That's going to be the first calculation. And then the second calculation is going to be really a model of colloids with DNA. Um, I, mean, I didn't understand. The first one, yeah. the, the ones that's the same color in here, uh, is that the rule? Yeah, so I'm going to know they don't. So I'm going to be more precise about the way that, I'm going to be more precise about this in a minute. But in, in brief, the, um, so blue um, has some binding energy, a uh, red, sorry, I can see my color, right? I can't even. That shows you where my brain is. So red sticks to red with some strength. Red sticks to blue with some strength. Red sticks to green with some strength. And, it, 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 and, 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 that's the, and so there's, a, there's essentially going to be a matrix of interactions that controls the binding of these things, mm -hmm. and the colors are just the different types of pieces. So I'm sorry, Michael, how does the branching work? Which branching? Well, just it looks like these yeah. pieces could only make chains. Yeah. Well, no, but not if there's no chains. Oh, but, oh, oh, I'm sorry. The J is a, is a separate piece, which is allowed to be there. Yeah, yeah, we're going to. Okay. No, no, I, I mean, if you put branches in, it's more fun. It's not yeah, of course. <laughs> I just want to know where they came from. Yeah, well, they're just those that just change. Well, yeah, okay, so, um, okay, so for each model, these are going to be equivalent calculations. We want to know what can be built, what can't be built, what determines the yield. And then, as I say here, no, still, I don't really completely understand something. So every model has sort of a different mathematical complexity, both of which are really present in the full problem. The full problem is you just put stuff <coughs> like, of all shapes in a jar, and we do this. One, so in, in, in the colloidal case, I mean, so, so one hard thing about doing statistical mechanics calculations, which is what we're going to do, which, by the way, is not necessarily the, what you should be doing. I should basically be just in the interest of, you know, full, full discussion, really, not even disclosure of what the problem is. It is not clear that one should be playing these games in equilibrium. And in fact, I might even make a stronger statement that really one shouldn't be playing these games in equilibrium. But we're doing it because you have to start. This is a well-posed problem. And I think you learn a lot from this. Hope so, didn't you? Um, so, um, so we're going to focus on equilibrium yield. So a colloid problem, you know, the problem is if you're going to compute equilibrium, you have to enumerate the structures that can form. And that's like, a, these are wonderful mathematics problems. So I'll show you at least one interesting mathematics problem. And actually, I brought this toy. So some of you, this talk I realized is boring. I brought this. I, I had this toy and I couldn't get this. Did you ever find this new? You know, th these toys, these were, we, we, we did research on these toys for years. Price is no, no, the price has gone down, actually. <laughs> the price has now gone down. So the problem with these toys is that they, um, th this box is like $8. Um, and, and the reason is, is that so these toys there was a um, there was a um, th there was a um, the problem is, is they they were banned <coughs> they were banned because if children eat two of the magnets th yeah if children eat two magnets one magnet is okay but two <laughs> magnets it turns out the range of the magnet is of order of the scale of the small intestine of a child and, and that sort of problem so um, so they went off the market but then there was this magnet company called CMS Magnetics. That, um, that you can go and they, um, they, they, I don't know how they deal with this. I, probably the fact that this is taped is now problematic. Um, but um, they make them and so you can play with them. So here, I'll just pass this around. So this is if you, if you feel tired, then you can just play with the toy. Um, and, and it will come up actually in a little bit. So, We're getting into our grandchildren for this Very good. Well, it's actually an interesting, I can tell you interesting things to ask your grandchildren about the toy to do in the course of this talk. But anyway, um, okay. So, um, and, and you're supposed to build bigger clusters actually. That, that's when it gets interesting. I mean, you know, you can only build one out of four particles. Okay, um, so here, this is an important philosophical point. So th this talk is already <laughs> going slowly, so it's clear it's not going to end, but I should just basically focus on the important philosophical point. So w the reason that this problem is hard, uh, sort of, that we're talking about, is because what you would like to say is you would like to invent an energy function which every contact that you want sticks and every contact that you don't want, like, just make it repel. That's what you would like to do. Right? If you could do that, then there would not be a problem. But unfortunately, somebody can correct me, but all of the ways that I know to actually introduce specificity and binding do not allow this. And they're all using sort of methods, chemical methods, which are very, or either exactly like, or very much like the hybridization of complementary strands of DNA. And so 
imagine that you have two complementary strands. This is the strands in DNA bricks, or the strands that are coded in colloids. Um, then, um, then the point is, is that is that there's still some binding energy in a random strand to either one of the complementary strands that you put in. And so if I tell you that I have 10 stickers that I'm going to coat this thing with, and I'm going to design, so it's a wonderful, actually, mathematics problem, whatever, to please design the sequence of each of the 10 stickers so that they're as far apart as, uh, from each other as they can in this binding energy space, including, by the way, sliding, right? It actually becomes, there's a wonderful <coughs> mathematics problem, but still, you can't get rid of the fact that there's some amount of nonspecific attraction that there is. And as soon as there is nonspecific binding, then you have to worry about the wrong things happening. And the reason that this is a problem, this is a problem in both of the models that I will talk about, is that as you start increasing the number of different pieces that you're going to put in, the pieces could either be, you know, if we're going to do colloids, the number of different types of balls that we put in, or they could be, if you're building a finite concentration, the, just the number of things there are, then the, the, um, the basically the, 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 uh, the, there are really combinatorially many things that can go wrong. Right, so I mean, if you just imagine, and this will work for some fraction of this audience, of computing the partition function, which is the relevant thing. There's the partition function, the desired thing. There's the thing that you want, and then there's a sum over all the junk. And, and the problem is, is that you can penalize the junk by making it have a bond that is different than the other. So for example, if you look at this, these things, suppose they were designed to make you know, blue, green, red. So this thing has a lot of energy, blue, green, green, red, because green doesn't like to stick to green. But the point is, is that, and, and so fine, so that's penalized you know, by some factor of the partition function. But there are so many, as the number gets bigger, there's combinatorially many things that can go into this partition function. And what you would think is that will kill you, basically. And then in the end, you're not going to get, you're not going to be able to do this. And if you think, by the way, about the picture of the cell that I told you about in the beginning, you know, where there's all this stuff around, and the thing is half ribosomes, and there are these 20 components, then it's mind-boggling how this can ever work. Seriously. So, I mean, I mean, you might be able to invent ways, you know, involving timing and whatever, but it's very, very hard. And that's the question that really we're trying to go after. And this model, I think, these two models get at one aspect of it. So, okay, so I'm going to just tell you the answer because I don't think this talk is going to You're not. Okay. How long is this talk? Yeah. An hour, give or take. So, so the answer in a nutshell, so I'm just going to tell you, no, I have a clock. These phones play multiple phones. So, so the answer in a nutshell is that apparently one really, I, I mean, I, well, it is, but you shouldn't worry so much. So I mean, it's true what I just said, that yield degrades with increasing um, structural size and complexity. It's totally true. It, it disagrees. If I asked you all, please sketch the yield, you would get it right. It just goes way down. It goes exponentially. But when you use the control knobs that you have, um, it is possible to basically correct for it. And this statement, we really are quite surprised by. Um, and, and I think to the extent that this talk has a result, then it's this statement. What is in both models? What are the both models, models, so two models, one model with these puzzle pieces, oh. and the other model is basically that toy. Those are the two models. And those are, as I said, illustrating two different things. And you'll see, I'll set them up in some other In fact, two models, here we go. So this is now, um, because I'm now going to go through in turn, I'm going to describe each of the models. This is sort of a high level description. Um, I was actually told to give a high level description. This might be, I don't know where this is on, what it's, on, the, on the page that I don't know what it should be. but. The, um, but I'm going to basically give a high level description of, of the model, hopefully in more detail, explaining what the calculations are, tell you the results in both of these two cases, and then we'll just philosophize for a little while and then I'll shut up. That's basically the show. So, okay, branch puzzle pieces. So, the one thing to say is that both of these models, the mathematical structure of both of these models is the same in the following sense that you, when, when I give you a structure, the structure is, um, is, is characterized by an adjacency matrix. So, this is a matrix right, where you put a one when two particles stick to each other and a zero. Otherwise, this is the adjacency matrix of an octahedron, which if anyone has the toys, and you can split them up so you can all have pieces of toy. You can build an octahedron with a toy. Um, and so there's an adjacency matrix that, that, that associated with the structure. And basically what we're gonna do is that every time there's a zero, if you want to design right for a thing, then every time there's a zero, you're gonna say that's minus epsilon, and every time there's a contact you want, you're gonna call it minus E naught. And the point is that epsilon really should be drawn from some distribution. And um, and we're assuming in both models that the interactions are short range, they're, they're, that the range is short relative to the size of the structures. If you relax that, then things just get much more tricky, more difficult to calculate. It's not clear that you, um, well, actually, we can talk about that later. And, um, and that's the deal. So in, so in the, the, one question is, is sort of what's the set of adjacency matrix or structures that you have to sum over? And in colloids, that's determined by geometry. It's basically the set of structures you can make out of that toy. Yes? So in the picture that you drew, the, uh, the, the units that were there, 
had uh, were asymmetric. They had male, male and female. Yes. And so does the, that, does the adjacency matrix favor just one of those? No, no, it will. So you'll code the contact. So in the case, if so in the puzzle pieces model, then you will say that then, then you will absolutely make it so there's a male and female part. Absolutely. Right, but where's that in the yeah. adjacency matrix? So will you be quoting yeah. both? Yeah, so you're going to report. So then it's slightly more complicated. You're right. You're, you're actually right. So if it has a male and female part, your, your comment is correct. Is, then you have to actually also keep track of whether you're on the male side or the female side. So that, that makes it slightly more <coughs> So you're totally right that in this case, you have to, I mean, right. I'm clear. So, okay. Um, okay, so branch puzzle pieces. Okay, so I've already shown this slide. So the one thing is, is that if you think about sort of summing up, so we're going to compute partition functions. Is, I mean, what matters, of course, are the breaks, right? That is, that is, you have fragments. There are the desired structures and there are fragments. And the fragments are characterized by the number of places along the chain that, that, the, uh, that you know, the incorrect interaction is occurring. And, um, and each break costs money. So okay. So um, so by thinking about the, the sums, the sort of statistical against problems, the sum of our fragments, it makes the energy easy to compute because basically now, now, this is now a sum over configurations. That's right. So in, in particular, so I should basically say this again because this is a very important. This is very important. So th th this is the essence. So that is the fragment model. So the, the main difference. That there are two main differences between these two models. Well, this model, we are putting the puzzle pieces in at finite concentration. So there is in the back, there's a chemical potential that's associated with each one of the, um, of the components. And this is then a sum of all possible configurations that you can get um, from the back. Um, in the, um, and in the, in the, when we get to the college one, we're not going to put finite concentration because it's, it's, it's too hard, actually, even um, as it stands. Okay? No, this is the essence. This is the thing. So, okay, so you can sum this. And the point is, the, um, there's a chemical potential um, for each, and, and actually you can imagine setting it up so that all of the tiles have equal chemical potential, or you can imagine setting it up so that the concentrations of each of the tiles that you're putting in the bath have the same stoichiometry as the concentrations in the assembled component. This is what people, the biologists, call the balance hypothesis, um, right? That, that basically, that, you know, the, the level of you, of you um, produce a protein that's in a complex, basically, should be imbalanced with the stoichiometry in the structure. Um, and, um, and, the, um, and then this is the sort of number of fragmentations with area A, or the number of, you know, the number of contacts that you've broken. And so you basically have to compute these numbers. Okay. So, um, so, okay, so the simplest problem to think about, this is a classical problem in physics, is, um, is just imagine all the pieces are the same. So it's sort of well known that it's very, very hard to control the length of a polymer which is made out of pieces which are exactly the same. If we call mu the chemical potential of the, um, of the, um, of, of, of the monomer, which is basically the entropic cost of pulling the monomer out of the bath, then basically there are sort of two different possibilities. You either say if E is the binding energy betwe uh, between two of these guys, then if E is less than mu, then basically what happens is, is that um, the things would rather be in the bath than be stuck to each other. And so you end up with a yield curve that says that the yield decreases monotonically as a function of length. If E is bigger than U, then you have the opposite situation. Then you basically get explosion of lead. But what you don't get is the selection of a particular way. So a simple question that you could ask is that if I make all of the pieces different, if I now have a matrix, this is my matrix of energies, right, of, of interaction energies, and I, I'm, I'm going to choose, I mean, in principle, the chemical potentials can all be different, then the question that you can ask is, can I actually select out a way by doing this? And so I should say, the way that we do the calculations, I'm suppressing many details in this, is that the epsilons, the way we've set this up is that the epsilons are the um, non-specific binding, and the calculation is set up so that those can be chosen from the distribution that you can prescribe. So, you know, if you're doing, you know, DNA, whatever, there's sort of binomial-like distributions or whatever, but, but epsilon is drawn from the distribution, and E is the fixed binding energy of these things. So, um, so the question is, is, can you actually set this thing up in a way that the yield actually, um, right, does pick out a length? That's the question. Um, and so it turns out there's a regime where you can do this. And the regime, that is, and, and what has to be true, and this should be, uh, hopefully this is, um, is that the binding, the energy of, of the binding, the energy, the energy of two sticking to each other, E, has to be bigger um, than the, um, than, than, you know, it has to be much better than epsilon, the, uh, the incorrect binding. I mean, it, it does, because if they were all the same order, then it would be like homopolymer problem. You have to make it not be a homopolymer. And the question is, well, how much bigger does it have to be? And that's sort of basically entropic. The, the, the sort of calculation shows that 
that the, that the, the regime where this works is, is that if e, the correct binding minus the, so some average, not specified, but well, I, that's, I'm not going to tell you at the moment, of the incorrect binding is bigger than something which is logarithmic in the number of different modulars that you have. There's a result where a and b actually um, are numbers that depend on the topology of the structure that you're trying to build. At the moment, we're building linear structures. Um, so if you then do the calculation, I'm now suppressing a lot of, I don't know if you like this sort of thing, pretty mathematics, but the, um, so if you then do the calculation, so this is a calculation of the log base 10 of yield as a function of the structure size. This is done in a way that all of these guys, so we're now in the regime where we're picking out a polymer of a particular size, and, um, and, we're, and all of these are different. So the, the guy with 20, there are 20 different pieces that are in solution. These are all done with equal concentrations. So I have 20 different components of equal concentrations. Yes, you right. put them in and you ask what is the yield, right? And you can do this at every structure size. And what happens is that the yield decays rapidly with um, it, it, it decays rapidly with um, with structure size, which is what I argued should happen at the beginning. It's because there, the number of competing structures goes up combinatorially with this. So yield decays with that. Now, but you do have a bit of a control. So this, I, the next statement that I make, I think is interesting. So if you're bored, then you might still be bored in a second, but you, you should be actually less bored. The next so the um, so the thing that's interesting is is that this chooses all the concentrations equal to each other. If you think about the physics for a moment, and here I'm going to just show you one plot. So this is the log of the partition function for a structure of size s. So remember, so we're, imagine that we're making, and this is done for structures of length five. So this is the structure you want to build, one, two, three, four, five. And this is, so you know, there's some partition function of structures of length four. And if you look what at those are, what, you know, given these stickers, what can you make? You can make one, two, three, four, you know, or you can make two, three, four, five. You know, and then here, you know, what can you make? One, two, three, two, three, four, Three, four, five. They're also incorrect ones that you can make, of course. And the point is, is that if you look at this, you'll notice that the that the that the, 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 the first a one and a five, which are at the ends, only occur in correct structures. So <coughs> you might imagine that if you increase the concentration of those guys relative to the other, you would actually favor the formation of the thing that you want. And indeed, if you optimize, if you solve this problem and you optimize, then this is the uh, this is actually chemical potential. It's not concentration. This is the optimal. Um, um, this is actually for length 10, it's not length 5, but this is the optimal profile. And this is it. Whereas basically what you do is you make the guys at the end, concentrations at the end, bigger than the guys at the middle. So okay, that's all fine. But what's interesting is this plot, which I... Um, if you then go and you plot the yield of these optimized guys, then what you do by basically choosing the concentrations of the individual species correctly is you totally correct for this effect. That is, it, there's a very slight... Um, but it, it, it's very slight um, on this. That the yield basically becomes independent of the structure side, but you have to tune the concentrations correctly. So we did this, Arvid did this, and we were like, wow. But then we were, you know, this is the other, but the, um, you know, the, um, I mean, the problem is, if, you know, is this, these are chains. I mean, who the hell wants to make polymers? I mean, that's boring. Um, so I mean, if you go to this database, then, I mean, this is just an illustration of reality, right? That is, there are all of these different graphs, and they tend to be basically branched structures. So the question was, is this sort of thing still true for branched structures? So, um, so branch structures, this is when, this is what Andy said before, they're junctions. So now we're going to put in junctions. And we're going to do it in exactly the way these pictures suggest, male and female parts, whatever. And we, um, or rather, Arvin sort of designed large sets of different structures that you could imagine building. So there are these structures, um, these other structures. You can imagine making them. And, um, and the question is, you know, for structures, what you want to do is fix the number of monomers and change the structural complexity from something which is a chain to something which becomes very branched. Um, when it becomes very branched, you assume that the complexity of the landscape increases and does the same thing occur. And so actually, Arvind, who was a string theorist before he was doing this, um, so one day walked in very happy that, in fact, there's a beautiful way you can compute these partition functions using Feynman diagrams because the, um, yeah. because basically you have to, given the junctions, you have to sum over all lengths of, of, um, of chains that are connecting the two junctions. So you simply sum over the junctions and then you're left with just a function of the, of the concentrations of the, of the individual junctions. And it makes the calculations very pretty. And also makes this computationally extremely efficient. Otherwise, um, this is, you know, doing this is a nightmare. And then actually, I, I gave a talk, and I didn't think Paul was out. This is why I'm so embarrassed. That I, you know, maybe you weren't there. And someone said, oh, didn't you read the literature? And Dijen figured out that, you know, there was a connection between pop climate diagrams and branch polymers in 1969. But anyway, so but using that, you can calculate. That was really just a slide to say. There are interesting calculations in the middle of this. So that is, if you plot yield as a function of the number of arms, this is for 25 component things, 
This is the linear guy, and now you just increase the number of branches. These are just structures of different topologies. <coughs> the yield goes down. And now, but this is all with all the components put in at equal concentrations. If you now say, well, I'm going to release that, um, then um, if you optimize, then what we find is that, that again, um, the, the optimal concentrations are highly heterogeneous. In general, the, um, the, the concentration of the outside guys are higher than those of the inside guys. But, but it's actually deeper than that. It's actually deeper than that. And the reason that it's deeper than that is if you really want to choose concentrations, remember what your problem is. You always have to remember like, what your problem is. So your problem is, is you put these things in and you're forming all these things you don't want. So if you list all the things you don't want, what you really want to do is to choose the concentrations to get rid of them as much as you can. And the question is how well you can do it. So you can imagine, so we started back to this game of taking like this guy and making all the structures that you don't want. And then if you sort of think through what the computed optima are, this is the computed optima for this, in the context of this, then it's basically that it's, it's chosen, these concentrations are chosen to get rid of all the competing structures. And when you then sort of remake this plot, this is the yield as a function of the number of arms, instead of decreasing, the yield is essentially constant again. And this is a result that we, I would say, partially understand. I can babble about it if somebody would like to. But it basically states that the yield, that if you choose the knobs that you have, the concentrations corrected, you can make the yield in these things essentially independent of the structure that you're trying to build, which I think is really quite interesting. Um, both from the point of view of technology and from the point of view of just intellectual extra frameworks to think about biology. And I will give one slide and then check my phone for what time it is. And I mean, so the, 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 the consequences for technology are this, is that, I mean, the question is, is what concentrations you choose to put the components in. So the DNA nanotechnology business, it's always done at equal concentrations. Uh, and there's a, there's a critical size above which you can get. And this states that you, that, you know, by thinking about this a little bit, then um, you might be able to make the same thing. And I guess I sort of become fascinated by this. Um, can I, that, yeah. that, that was a particular subset of yeah. structures here that's pretty small. Yeah, so, right. So to what extent is this just experimental and to what extent do you actually know that you can do this? So, we, so what you can do is you can, given a structure, you can sum over the bond breakage events, right? So that is, you, can, you can write down an expansion Right, of, of which you can know what each of the terms in the expansion are, and then you can test by doing the optimization over the terms with every term in that expansion. You know, at what point does it make not make a difference? And beyond a certain term, I mean, we just started going beyond a certain term, it doesn't make a difference. So we believe that this is actually, you know, you know, although it's true, you can make more. That is, it's not really a problem. And moreover, remember that um, that the um, that we really don't have computational problems for single polymers. The computational problems come in in the branch thing. And as soon as you realize that these things are really sums over right, you know, all lengths of these with the junctions, then you can start to convince yourself that you really can compute the, the landscape. But is it really true that if you, if you, well, I don't know if I answered your question, but, but it's, um, this is not, this is actually the result of a numerical simulation of optimizing concentrations in an actual calculation of the partition function where the partition function is truncated at some order um, that we sort of showed by checking higher orders that it's true. It's not a theorem. But it's a, I think it's a reasonable um, statement. It's heuristically plausible, for sure. Yeah, yeah, well, you can use, I would make a slightly stronger statement about that. That's fine. I don't think I'm going to tell you. Michael, what is your yield? Your yield is the fraction incorporated in your target structure yeah. over the total mass. Yeah, yeah. that's right. It's, it's, it's the actual yield. It's not, I mean, these are the important questions. That is, you could use a, a different def definition, but we're just yeah. trying to. Um, I mean, the, the, you know, our point was really to just try to get some way to think about this, and so you can. So, um, so I, it's the least generous definition of the yield that you could. Yeah. Can you enumerate all the possibilities, or are all the possibilities of, of structure branched structures? You mean of these? Yes. Yeah. Well, so the way that this was done is that we so we can't we didn't attempt to do that. What we did was make a large library of different branch structures. We said we would like to assemble an H. We like, so I would call this a millifuge. We want to assemble this. And, you, know, you can put more arms, of course. You can just add more and more arms. And then for each one, we basically you know, coded for it the way that I told you. That is, you say every correct bond is, um, has a strong strength, and every incorrect bond has a, right. a strength. No, I understand. That's targeted design, yeah. or whatever yeah. you want to call it. But can you actually enumerate um, you mean, you mean all, all the possible that structure given the rules? I'm not sure given our rules. I'm not sure our rules mm -hmm. are, I mean, I think that you can. The graph theory. I think the graph theory that. can enumerate. Someone here knows better than I can. Somebody's not in it. All possible graphs, that's, that's what you're asking. 
So that seems, you know, you can sort of make up, that seems, we could, but this was really done, these different things were chosen to sort of just increase structural complexity to see what happened when you do this. According to what we termed the balance hypothesis, an imbalance in the concentration of the subcomponents of a 13 protein complex can be deleterious. And so the balance hypothesis is basically the hypothesis that you should um, you should put concentrations in that are the same as the concentrations that are in the structure. I guess I just this was meant there not to say that you should take this seriously, but just to say that this is giving us a lot to think about. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the implications of the last statement, because if I scan the abstract, they yeah. seem to be saying that you should put things in equal concentrations, and you said before that they shouldn't. Well, you know, this is a paper. I, now I'm yeah. okay. Now I have to be careful. That's okay, we won't uh, <laughs> you, you know, I like to say it this way. So, we're theorists. Well, so I'm a theorist. Our job is to do calculations, and to say what the calculation says. Right. And whether it agrees with experiments is not our problem. <laughs> Surely one would assume that nature has optimized things already so that the well, I mean, concentrations can... should be correct in the structure. That, that the concentrations in the structure. So, so, to so, be so, so I guess we can talk about this later. So we can talk about this over wherever, tea or maybe something afterwards. It, but I, I guess what I would say is the following. So there are, if you go and look, and we started, you go look at sort of ribosome biogenesis, which I think is by far the most interesting example if we're talking about biology. And you know, you, that the concentrations of the different components of the ribosome are expressed at different levels. And then you say, why is that? And of course, it's complicated. There are lots of possible reasons. And I just say this is one intellectual framework to investigate it, which is interesting. I, I don't want to say anything more than that at the moment. It does make very, very specific suggestions which you can imagine testing. I mean, you know, the reason that I said that to China was not just to try to make fun of that, but was because, of course, if the, um, well, because it's fun. I mean, it's, it's fun. Right? But, but, but it's also that, um, but it's also that, um, that, you know, if the model disagrees with the experiment, then you have to, then either the experiment is wrong or the model has to be fixed. So, you know, that's what we're supposed to do. So I'm not, right. Yeah, no, I was just curious about the implications that one was supposed to draw. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very interesting. I mean, the thing is that the high yield in the DNA self-assembly business, using this other definition of yield than the one that we use, is all done at equal concentrations. And, you know, as Arvind has pointed out to me on a number of occasions, which I, I think is really a very good point, I mean, you could, there are lots of ways of criticizing this. One, another tack you could go for criticizing this is that this is all equilibrium calculations. And that's actually a really very serious thing, the equilibrium thing. But the point is, that is that the, the idea that the way that you would design interactions is to basically design against competing structures is really a general, I mean, that is, it, it, it's true in general, actually. And so, um, anyway, this is even more. <coughs> so, so now, I'm, I'm really sort of running out of time. I'm college so, at the end. Uh, <coughs> one more question on this. Uh, why can't you play with the temperature? Oh, you can play with the temperature. Because, because if you have structures you, you which know, can bond at yeah, a certain yeah. temperature. You, you of course can play with the temperature. No, no, you, you of course can play with the, with the temperature. And I mean, you should choose the temperature to optimize the, the yield, and that's what's done. I mean, there is, I mean, it's always true, right, that in an equilibrium calculation, as this was, then when you raise the temperature, the thing will fall apart. Because with, when KT is much bigger than the bond strength, it will fall apart. And in an equilibrium calculation, you never get kinetically stuck. I mean, what really happens in life is when the temperature gets down too low, then that means that you never get rid of incorrect bonds, so the thing is not equilibrated. But in an equilibrium calculation, you just assume that you're waiting long enough for that, and then it goes to, a, to some yield, which is what we're characterizing, right? Which is the way that we're characterizing this. And then you can, you, you can always ask, right, for the yield at that temperature. So temperature is an important variable, but it's also, the dimensionalist number is bond energy, bond energy over KT. So another yeah. way to answer your question. Well, but what you can do is, is uh, have certain bonds work at certain temperatures. So uh, slowly decreasing the temperature, you can actually drive the evolution to very oh, right. high. So, so right, good. So, so you can, so there's a lot of freedom here. So what you're pointing out, and I agree with this, and if I get through this next one, I will start to Sorry. hint at this. No, 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 but I'm not gonna get through it, so it doesn't matter. I think it's more important <laughs> to focus on the ideas. But that is, there's a lot, there's more freedom than what I've discussed. This was simple. That is, and what you're saying, and I completely agree with this, is you can imagine playing with bond strengths. And in particular, right, and, and you could imagine, I mean, there's a question of how would you choose them? And, you know, there's a certain sense in which, I mean, there's a whole set of numbers, and we can talk about this that way. We sort of thought about this, but just roughly speaking, at first approximation, there are only two numbers that matter. 
right? There's either having a bond strength which is strong enough that at the temperature you're at it doesn't fall apart, but then it will equilibrate. And then there's the one that's much stronger than that where it's essentially irreversible. And it is true, and I think I'm not going to get through this next one, but we certainly have evidence that by choosing some bonds to be irreversible, you can actually do a lot. There are control knobs in this problem. And, and, and I mean, you know, so. But I don't really know much more than what I just said, so it's actually good that I don't have a lot of time to talk about. Okay, so color. So I'm going to only talk about this. So I think what I'm going to do is I have 10 more minutes. Is that right, Andy? Is that good? 10 minutes? Is that right? Is that good? So I'm going to spend five minutes talking about colleagues, and I'm going to spend five minutes just talking about general nonsense, and then we'll end. Is that okay? So the interesting thing about the Colloid problem is that, uh, is that the, um, is that what we thought at the beginning, it, it, well, I mean, first of all, Paul makes colloids, so that's interesting, because then we can talk to Paul. Uh, and, um, but, and, and actually, Paul's colloids and the colloids that tend to be made, although th there are differences now, that, that, that tend to be uniformly coded in stickers so that they're sort of radially symmetric, which basically means it's sort of the exact opposite of this male-female part of thing. Um, and the thing is, is that you know, if you want to compute partition functions, you have to compute structures. And so, <coughs> um, and so it, you, the first problem you have to solve if you want to study this in the way that I've been describing is you have to actually ask, and this is if any of you decide, despite my warnings, to give a, a child relative of yours this toy for the holidays, then um, one thing you can ask them is the following thing. So suppose I give you five balls. Um, how many structures can you make on five balls? Please give me a complete list of structures. And then you can say, then they'll tell you the answer to that. That's pretty straightforward, actually. I mean, if it's, um, and then you say, well, what about six balls? And, and then you can do seven balls and eight balls. And, and you keep them busy for quite a long time because you know that the number of structures actually is going to grow, right, exponentially, essentially, with the number of balls. And so we, so there's a graduate student that was working with us, a couple of years ago, Natalie Arcus, or some of you, Paul because Natalie was amazing, and she basically spent her PhD thesis walking around with bags of these toys um, and um, trying to figure out how to count them all. Um, and um, you know, the thing is, is that these are small structures. You can build complicated things out of this as well. So OK, so actually, um, let me see. How am I going to do this in five minutes? OK, this is what I'm going to tell you. So, um, so I'm going to show you a list of all of the structures of each end. We're gonna, um, what we did was to sort of then ask, if you were going to color them, that you were going to put interaction matrices, the sort I was going to say, then what are the characteristics of yield that come from the interaction matrices in all possible, you know, all clusters, and we went up through n equals 9 or 10 or something like that. So we have a lot of data, basically. And then we decided to ask, what determines yield and what can we do to, um, to, um, to go after it? And for a long time, the, the question that we wanted to ask was this. We wanted to know if you could build something that was complicated with reasonable yield. And, and I, when we started thinking about this, I was in Paris on sabbatical, and I think you were there. Like, you're all, where did I go? <laughs> Sorry. And yeah. Paul was there. Oh, you were there. You were there. Was, but you were at the conference, and, and there was this museum in Paris that basically had a children's exhibit of, of things made out of these toys, and there was this picture of Big Ben. And, and so we then decided, well, we've got to make Big Ben. Uh, can we do it? And so actually, um, so this is a simulation. Brown, it's essentially Brownian dynamics. It's a physics, but it's a physical simulation to the extent of only the, the interactions. It's, it's 79 particles, if I'm remembering correctly, um, all of which interact by a 79 by 79 matrix with numbers that are chosen according to those rules. And this is that thing forming Big Ben. Where's the clock? The clock? Yeah, there's, no big bend, yeah. there's no clock. There's no clock. But you know what I mean. That's what we're saying. That's what's our Big Ben. And, and, but, but this is not science. So the interesting thing, the interesting thing is what's the yield? Right? Because the problem with Big Ben, it's like the problem with all of this, is there's so many things that could go wrong. And so this is a figure that I just want to dwell on. These are yield curves. This is from simulation as a function of temperature but divided by bond energy for several different structures. This is Big Ben, this black curve. And these are other complex structures. And I want you to notice this number. It's like 50%. The yield is pretty high. I mean, 50%, I think, is high, actually. And we didn't try. I guess the, the, the thing that sort of struck us about this is we didn't try, we just did it, right? There was no effort, there was no choosing bond strength to be irreversible or anything like this. You could only do better than this. And so the yields are high. These structures tend to have an order of 100 particles, and the yields are high. Which, <laughs> what is the difference of this model with diffusion limit of aggregation? Why you have compact structures? Because these, don't, these are not irreversible binding. So diffusion oh, limit, so they they, yeah, they, no, this is the whole point. I mean, if they were, they this roll. is why, right? So this is why, so this is why, look, at zero temperature, the yield goes down. 
And that's because now you're, this is the regime of diffusion limited aggregation, because basically if you bind and you never unbind, then you just form cracks, right? And the point is there is a temperature, this is sort of the bond melting, this is roughly where a single bond melts mm -hmm. right here. And so th this is sort of, you know, th this is a kinetic effect really, it basically the fact that there's a maximum. It comes from the company of the equilibrium kinetics. And so we spend a lot of time studying, and I'm not gonna go through this, I'm gonna just skip this whole part, um, what determines these yields, you know, theoretically, quantitatively, whatever, and it's, the answer is sort of what you expect. There are low y and local minima that are competing with them that can be characterized. And I'm now going to, this is the embarrassing part, I'm gonna like skip through all the slides that I planned to do in this talk, which was clearly poorly designed, um, and get to the end and just tell you a couple of ideas and then shut up. This is the embarrassing part. Oh, but that's it, you should see Natalie's list. So if your children, if anyone decides to buy this for their children, it turns out there are 16 different packings for n equals eight. These are, these are with the maximal number of the contacts, 13 and three chiral pairs. It's always embarrassing, but you know, this is the good thing about this is that speakers have to like show what they were thinking they were gonna do. So you see how bad it was. All right, it keeps going, it's really bad. It was a badly designed talk. Bad Big Ben, yield curves, explanations, kinetic manipulation. Oh, see, irreversible bonds. It showed up, irreversible bonds, if this were, um, okay. I now want to just talk about the answer. So the thing that I guess I'm most interested in at the moment, this is the last three minutes, I promise I'm done. Uh, but I just want to, is, is sort of, you know, what can you do beyond this? We sort of, I mean, to say, to say that we're bored by this is a bit of an overstatement. There are lots of questions here to answer, but sort of what became <coughs> clear at some point was that, you, you know, it's a question of how close you want to be in any of this to an experiment. And, and I'll say it in the following sense, that, um, that, you know, what I've described to you, for example, with respect to these colloids is that we're going to coat the colloids with stickers, and the stickers are going to correspond to an interaction energy matrix of, of, you know, A sticks to B with what strength. But in principle, you could imagine doing things that are more exotic. Um, and in particular, the more exotic thing you could do is you could imagine having, like, a little computer program um, on every um, sphere that says, depending on who bounds you, then I'm going to do this. Like, a set of sort of, like, almost cellular automata-like rules. <coughs> And this becomes really interesting, actually, because for one thing, you can then bug Paul productively instead of just complaining about that. Say, hey, Paul, could you please make a particle so that A binds to B, it changes its interaction so that C presents something different, right? There's sort of chemical challenges, and it's also, from the point of view of abstracting about biology, very interesting. And so I, um, so one thing we did with this was, um, was that Zorana sort of asked whether or not one could sort of uh, use these matrices to produce things that self-replicate. So for example, um, this is the, the energy, the interaction energy matrix that, that codes for an octahedron. So an octahedron basically is coded for six particles where um, the red doesn't like the red, but it likes the blue and the green, and it's symmetric, so it's true for all of them. And, um, and, and so Zorana basically figured out a way, which I was not planning on describing actually, of designing interactions between a, a rather large number of particles, 10 different particles, that makes essentially a cyclic um, you know, the cyclic reaction which actually leads to self-replication. And the, 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 the sense in which I say leads to it is we have this computer code that we've built that, although I haven't emphasized it, is really very well calibrated against a set of experiments. That is, it's, um, and we, and our, our, our reality in this is we sort of design them and then we check whether or not the computer simulations actually show exponential growth. And this is just a computer simulation that shows that the self-replication cycle really works. It does require something, which I'll use the word novel, with the interaction energy matrix, that is, you have to have a melting condition that requires something to happen, which is hard to basically make occur on the, you know, on, you know, currently. But this is sort of one direction. Um, this is a simulation. The other thing I sort of said that so the, the possibilities for allosteric, I think, are, are just spectacular. Like I mean, allosteric. Allosteric means that if A binds, to, so suppose A binds to B because A likes B, but now suppose they present a different <coughs> interaction for C. Right. When when they're together. So that something happens when A binds to B, so that maybe if they're proteins, then they sort of ungrow conformational change, right? And they present, that's why I'm using the word allosteric, and they basically present a different interface for C. But you know, with Colloids, Paul, I think, actually can make A bind to B. Well, maybe he can't, but I think he can. He can. He can make A bind to B that changes the interaction for C. So the point is, is that, so the question is, what can you do with this? And, um, but, is that the same thing as a three-body interaction? Yeah, you could call it that. Yeah, absolutely, it's three-body. And you could do four-body and five-body. Right. These are all local, the way that we're doing it. Yeah. There are no long range, but still, you can do it. But, but the question is, and I think this is the important thing, is that, you see, you have to figure out what you can actually do with them. Because if you just make them, it's not going to... And so, the thing is, is that for me, this was sort of, I had this mind-blowing moment. I'll just show you this. Now, now I'm being taped, and I shouldn't say this. I'm going to get in trouble, so, but, okay. 
so be it. So I like spent the part of my you know, decade ago ranting about this book that um, well, just about cellular automata. I was on a rant about cellular automata. I don't know why I was on this rant. Cellular automata. No, it was the book Wolfram's book. Yeah, it's Wolfram's book. I was on this rant. Many of you might have shared the rant. And, 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 and I guess I, and I had this mind-blowing moment one day when I thought, actually, maybe this stuff isn't so useless after all. Because, but because the thing is, is that, so the problem with this, this is the Game of Life. This is beautiful. I'm not, I have no rant about the Game of Life. That's beautiful. Uh, but, I mean, the question, though, is, is it science, right? That's the, the question. I think. So, I mean, the, the problem with this is that it's so abstract that although it's doing this, you don't know what it means. But now I tell you, I'm going to give you objects. I'm going to give you Alistair. I'm going to give you the ability to design things. What can you make happen? I mean, maybe you can, you, that is, you could imagine making physically realizable local rules that create dynamic structures out of particles is totally possible. No I mean, I mean, idea. And moreover, if you then keep going with it, I don't know what to go with this, but this is, this is the place where I was taught, is you know, you look at this thing here, right? You know, everybody draws that and says, oh, you know, it's building structures. Well, maybe that's the wrong way to think about it. I mean, who knows what's going on? I mean, what we know is their interactions, they stick to each other, things change when other things happen. And, I just find this very interesting. What else are interactions between proteins coded for? Maybe actually the question that's underlying this talk is only a small part of the answer. Anyway, that's the end. So. <laughs>